today we will be discussing regarding the week 2 content and we will practice few MCQs. So for today the content will be firstly we will re revisit previous session doubts and then we will move to week 2 topics and practice few MCQs which are previous year MCQs and we will also follow up certain content that could help you in the week 2 assignment. So firstly in week 1 when I was dealing with you, then you asked me to provide you with the table in which there should be certain diseases and how they were being discovered, which methods were used and what are the locations, what are the genes that are involved. So I have summarized few methods and few diseases and which techniques were used and which scientists were involved in those uh, discoveries. So there is a small list. I hope it will help you. So uh, in the previous session, we talked about uh, cystic fibrosis uh, for which the disease gene was CFTR and the, it was located on the chromosome number 7 and it was discovered by the scientists Francis Collins and Lapchi Sui and they used the methods uh, linkage analysis and positional cloning. So in the previous session the question was about the technique which they have used. So the answer was positional cloning. So similarly there are other diseases as well and the genes that are responsible and which you can see and you can also read about chromosomal locations and name of the scientist. And one thing I want to add that in uh, certain diseases, there are more than two or three scientists that are involved. So for that, I've written various researches because there, there are many, so we can't write them in the table. And along with this, there are discovery methods and in, these are given in the order of the years. So you can see that how the techniques have advanced and how different diseases are now identified, which were previously not identified. So it will help you and in the next table I have also provided you with the abbreviations. So here the disease genes are provided in the small format and here I have explained that what does that mean. So you can read it from here that what are the different genes that are causing those diseases. And then here I have mentioned few uh, two three lines about the techniques that are being used. So few of them we will discuss here. So in this I have talked about electrophoresis and biochemical techniques. So these methods generally rely on separation of molecules based on their charge and size. So that is uh, about the electrophoresis which the people use and in the biochemical techniques also. So these techniques are generally used in the case of sickle cell anemia. So with, with the help of this technique they have identified HBB that is the gene that is hemoglobin subunit beta which is associated with sickle cell anemia. So this was the method which they have used. Uh, so in this what this method has helped them that it allowed them to identify the abnormal hemoglobin patterns which indicated that this gene is mutated during this disease. Similarly, there are some other assays such as enzyme assays in which we check for the activity of the enzyme that means if earlier it was performing the similar function that then now is it performing the same function or not. So for that we can compare between the normal person and the diseased person and with that by using the enzyme assays, we can identify the gene that is being uh, now mutated or changed or lost its activity. So in this way, the Tay-Sachs disease was the, the disease gene was identified for this disease. So the gene was hexoaminidase A enzyme and it was detected through the help of enzyme assays, which indicated that there is certain mutation in this gene due to which it is now not able to perform its catalytic function. Then similarly, there is another test that is Nutson's two-hit hypothesis. And this method was also used for the identification of disease gene for retinoblastoma. So what does this hypothesis say? That both the copies of a specific gene must be mutated to develop a disease. So for example, if a single gene, a single copy of the gene is mutated, then it will, it will not cause the disease because other gene will um, substitute its ex expression. So in that way, both copies must be mutated in order to uh, cause the disease. So that is this hypothesis and in this way they have identified the disease gene responsible for retinoblastoma. Similarly, linkage analysis also is a method in which we identify for the co-inheritance of genetic markers like a DNA sequence. So if two sequence lie closer to one another in the chromosome then there are chances that they will be inherited together. So with the help of the linkage analysis we can see that which gene is associated with the disease by looking the chromosomal distribution of the genes. Then we can perform restriction mapping in which we have discussed earlier that there are different uh, restriction endonucleases which identify certain recognition sequence and then they produce the cut. So they are very specific in their 
expression means very specific in producing the cut so by looking at the fragment length we can see that if there is change in the length of the fragments then it means there is some change in the recognition site so with that we can know that now this mutation might have caused the disease so in this way restriction mapping will also help you to identify the disease gene then comes positional cloning which was used in the case of cftr so it helps you to identify the means identification of the chromosomal region that is linked to the disease and it involves the linkage analysis and other methods in which you narrow down the specific gene that is responsible for the disease because you have the information of the entire chromosome that is responsible for certain disease then you narrow down the genes that are present in that region and then you identify that this particular gene is now related to this disease then comes dna sequencing so with the help of dna sequencing you can also identify the sequence directly and you can see that which nucleotides have changed now so it is the straight forward method and with this you can compare the mutations and variations that have occurred in the sequence of the dna then comes development of crispr cas9 editing technology so about this you have read in the week 2 so this is also a method of gene editing in which um, it has specific components due to which it identify the target dna and it modify the specific dna sequences so its main principle is to use its guide rna so this crispr and the cas9 so these two i um, mean one is the guide rna and another one is the cas9 enzyme which are involved in the precise targeting and modifying the dna sequence and this we will discuss in the later section so don't worry then there are certain studies on the genetic risk factors for example in apoe apoe4 apoe4's role as a genetic risk factor so the principle is that to investigate how specific genetic variants influence the disease risk progression and related biological processes so with the help of this we can see that how this uh, disease is increasing with means with the age or with time so with that way we can see the genetic risk factors for a particular disease so these are certain studies that are being performed then comes exome sequencing so when we uh, sequence entire dna then that is known as high throughput dna sequencing that is for the entire genome but when we specifically focus on the protein coding regions then that is exome sequencing and its principle is to identify the disease associated genetic variants by comparing the dna of affected versus unaffected individuals so with that you can compare and you can identify that where the change has occurred so that you can know that this particular region is involved with the disease so these are few methods which they have used now let's move to the another doubt which were raised in the previous session so in that session somebody was asking me about the activators and repressors and they asked me about the binding site of these for the same gene so when we say transcription factors then there are certain transcription factors which are known as basal transcription factors means that are defined transcription factors that bind to the promoter region and then they send signal to the rna polymerase to come to bind to the this sequence and then they take it to the initiation site and then the transcription will begin so these are the basal transcription factors but then other than basal transcription factors there are certain other factors that are activators or repressors which bind to certain other regions which are known as control elements and these control elements they are different for the activator and repressor region so activators are the protein that binds to the enhancer sites so those sites are known as enhancer sites because they are enhancing the expression of the gene because they are leading to more and more transcription because they are increasing the rate of transcription so that's why these are known as enhancer sites and activator proteins will be binding to those sites and then comes the repressor proteins which are performing the negative function to that of activator because now they are repressing this uh, function re repressing this transcription so they are binding to the silencer sequences so the sequence the name of the uh, particular sequences or the regions are termed as enhancer or silencer because of uh, because of the basis of the protein that is binding to them and what outcome outcome it is generating so that's why the name is enhancer or silencer so uh, this repressor protein is now binding to the silencer sequence and it is decreasing the rate of transcription because it is preventing the complex formation so what ultimately they does is that when they bind to this particular region then now they will not they will change the conformation or they will perform certain things due to which now rna polymerase will not be able to bind to this uh, particular region this it will not be able to recognize this rna i mean this a uh, basal transcription factor complex and it will not be able to transcribe so in this way both of them work but 
this uh, binding is quite tissue specific because there are certain epigenetic factors or there could be hormones that could uh, means mediate or they could alter al means they could alter the binding of these factors that are activators or repressors so this expression is quite you can say it is not fixed it could alter it could vary for example in this i have uh, shown that in skin cell the basal transcription factors are binding and gene is transcribing at the moderate levels but if you can uh, if you see in this liver cell nucleus then you will see that activator proteins are binding here and gene is transcribing at the high levels so there are certain epigenetic factors or certain other factors that are being involved and which are allowing this activator protein to bind here but if you see in the brain cell nucleus then in this activator protein is not binding but the repressor protein is now binding and due to which the gene is transcribed at very low levels uh, so in this it is not completely repressing this transcription but it is slowing it down because it is changing some uh, you can say it, it could do the modification at the level of the structure due to which now the binding will not be that much effective so that's why the transcription rate has now reduced so in this way these binding sites are fixed but they will bind or not that is tissue specific because it is depending on the external factors so i'll just take a follow up that are you guys able to follow okay yeah so they won't be asking you all these in the final exams so if you'll be having any doubts then you can give them in the chat if you're not able to unmute and say and i'll address to your doubts in the end now let's move to the next slide okay so in this i have shown that so uh, in the last i was also talking about that how the sequencing is being done so in this i have uh, tell that from where the sequences are being collected so there are different uh, uh, so it was related to metagenomics somebody was asking that uh, if the samples are collected from different tissues then will it be the metagenomic study so from the tissues if the samples are collected then it will only be of the same human being so when we say metagenome then it means the genome that is corresponding to multiple organisms so if the individual is same then it will not be the metagenomics so instead of tissue uh, we can say that if the samples are collected from the fecal blood swab urine so that are the places where there are chances to find the microbiome because other than human these are the places where you can find the other samples as well as as well for example the microbiome samples so from these places if the samples are collected and the study is performed then that will be known as metagenomic study so what happens here is that from these samples the sample is collected now they will contain dna related to bacteria fungi viral host depending on what kind of infection they have performed or uh, means there are certain microbiome which live with us in the symbiont association so their genetic material will also be collected now dna sequencing will be performed there are different techniques that are used for example there are certain alumina short read sequencing in which the short reads are being sequenced then there are certain long read sequencing methods such as nanopore or peg bio so they'll be sequencing the dna that has been collected from these samples now what they'll do they'll analyze it so, so now this is the metagenomic sample then there will be short read sequencing and long read sequencing and then they'll look for the marker based alignment and they'll create the entire sequence because you have obtained the short read you have to assemble those read into a single genome sequence so all those things are performed assembly is performed and then later on the comparisons are drawn that to which genome that sequence is more related to understand that which are the individuals or which are the microbes that are present in the sample so in that way ultimately you got to know that which are the individuals that are present in the sample and you will be able to know that Uh, what are the infections that might occur due to that so these uh, it has clinical applications you can detect the infections you can track the progress of outbreaks and you can predict antimicrobial resistance for example there are certain diseases like tb which has now generated resistance towards the drugs that were earlier provided so these all studies can be performed with the help of these sample analysis or the metagenomic analysis and you can predict the disease prognosis that how the disease is being uh um, means progressing with the time so all those studies can be performed by taking the samples and performing this metagenomic analysis 
so in the why the samples are collected from these regions because these are the regions where there are chances that there will be low, uh, low host dna content and more will be the foreign dna content that's why these samples are used and then there are other samples such as blood body fluid swaps and biopsy tissues so these have higher host dna content so what happen here is that we need to separate that host dna from the foreign dna so we need to use certain other methods we can perform target hts targeted hts is nothing but it is the high throughput sequencing that is targeted means you'll only be taking the sequences other than human sequences so in that you will be filtering out the host dna content then comes uh, mngs with the that is microbial ngs with the host dna depletion so in this you are performing the next generation sequencing by depleting the host dna and then comes microbial uh, next generation sequencing it is simply performed for the microbiome only means ignoring the host dna it won't be able to recognize the host dna so these are certain methods so you will be focusing on only those samples to perform metagenome analysis which contain least amount of host dna okay so now let's move to the another doubt so the in the previous assignment there was a question which asked you regarding the genome so what does genome refers to so in my previous session when i was uh, talking to you so i described that what genome is present in humans so generally human genome when we say genome in human so human contains three there are three genome that are present in human generally nuclear genome my, mitochondrial genome and microbiome so microbiome is the genome that is uh, present because of the symbiotic associated microbes that are present in our body they are also releasing certain enzymes proteins so if we take sample from our body then those genes will also be present so in this way these are the genomes that are present in human when we say human genome so these all are present but if we define them then definition is for the genome not human genome but for the genome the definition says that it is the entire set of dna instructions that are found in the cell so if we talk about the cell then in that the dna which is present that will be regarded as genome so in human the genome consists of 23 pair of chromosomes that are located in the nucleus but not just nucleus mitochondria also contains genetic material and uh, which is uh, prokaryotic in nature you can see and then they say that genome contains all the information needed for an individual to develop the function so in that question the answer was all the chromosomal dna that is present is considered as genome so all the genetic content so the answer was the genome is the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome that is present is regarded as the genome and not the microbiome when we say the genome but there are uh, later studies which say that this definition of genome which says that it contains all the information needed for an individual to develop and function is not true because you can see there are various factors that affect this and if you know the genome it doesn't mean that you know all the functions it, it will perform so certain studies i have included here so there is a paper which says the three genetics nuclear dna mitochondrial dna and gut microbiome of longevity in humans considered as metaorganisms so in this paper they have discussed that not just nuclear dna is governing the entire human functions but other genes such as mitochondrial dna and gut microbiome they also have important role to play so we cannot say that genome is the only region or genome is the only thing that defines the functions but there are other factors and there are very little studies that have been performed related to microbiome means the integration between the nuclear dna and microbiome so due to which uh, this is lacking but with the later with discoveries i hope the definition of genome will change then there was another paper which say what is a genome so in this paper they have said that um, all of the information needed to build and maintain a cell or an organism is not the best definition to define the genome while this definition is useful only in the context of online grocery for the public and by necessity and over simplification but if the genome is not complete set of dna containing all the information needed to build and maintain the organism then what it is so in this paper they have discussed that what could be a genome what could be a proper definition for genome and at last they said that genomes are not the sole source of cellular information but rather a more expensive archive of possible states that can be generated through interactions with internal and external factors so they are saying that we can't say that genome is only the guiding factor but there are certain other factors internal and external agents that are affecting the genome 
so this is all about the doubts that are about the previous session and now i'll proceed with the mcqs of the week 2 so i'll be asking you and you have to answer so it will be better if you could unmute and then answer because i won't be able to come back here and then see and i'll be dealing with your doubts in the end and if uh, i'll wait for a few seconds and then i'll answer the question if you will not reply so its answer is already visible so the question is in a polymerase chain reaction how many dna duplexes can be obtained at the end of four cycles if one uses two dna duplex molecules as the template dna so the options are 8 32 16 or 64 so in this they have asked you about how many duplexes you will get in the end if you start with the two dna duplexes so normally in pcr we amplify the sequence and we start with the single dna duplex so here they have started with the two dna duplex so what do you yes. think what would be the right answer ma'am the answer will be 64 it exponentially the amplification happens exponentially isn't it yeah the amplification is exponential so do you uh, so you say 64 2 raised to the power 4 right so 64 32 Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes. Anyone else? It is thirty-two, and this uh, set of questions were discussed in the previous session already. Okay, so week two. Week two. Somebody same question was there, and then in detail they provided the slide how you know uh, two double stranded DNA is there, then it comes as a you know. Uh, cycle one, there will be four. Then cycle two, it becomes eight. Okay. Then cycle three, sixteen. Then cycle four, thirty-two. So gave they gave all that uh, explanation in the previous session. Yeah. So that session was conducted on Sunday, I guess. So there are two sessions that are being kept for you, uh, and it is generally kept because there are broader audience which could not connect to that session. They can connect in this session. so the questions will be the same but you can ask your doubts in the session so the answers which are provided they will be different and the way the questions are discussed they will be different but the questions will be same in both the sessions so because we are provided with the list of questions that are from the previous year so the questions will be same but from next session i'll see if i could change the questions no, so no, that no no sure no issue the petition is helping us reinforces no problem thank you thank you okay so uh, there are two responses few are saying 32 and few said 64 so the correct answer will be 32 so how 32 because they have started with the two dna duplexes and at each level the increase is ex exponential so that means 2 raised to power n so there is there happened four cycles so 2 raised to power 4 multiplied by 2 so it will be 32 now here we will see so this is the pcr which involves the amplification it is the polymerase chain reaction and it involves the dna sample primers nucleotides tag polymerase is a specific type of, uh, type of polymerase which is used for this uh, pcr process it uses certain buffers and a pcr tube and a thermal cycler so all of these are involved in the pcr process and there are three main steps one is denaturation then annealing then extension and in this way the dna is being amplified at each cycle so if you start with the single copy then after one cycle you will obtain the two copies similarly after second cycle you will obtain the four copies two copies for each copy that you have obtained at the previous cycle and similarly at the fourth cycle you will obtain 16 copies if you start with the one dna duplex but here they have asked that you have started with the two dna duplexes so the answer will be 2 into 16 that is 32 so i hope it is clear so let's move to the next question so in this which one of the options is not true with regard to morpholinos so option 1 is a phosphor a phosphoro deamidate morpholino oligomer 
ऑप्शन टू इज कैन बी यूज फॉर जी नॉक जी नॉक साइलेंसिंग एप्लीकेशन ऑप्शन थ्री कैन ब्लॉक ट्रांसलेशन एंड ऑप्शन फोर कैन इंटीग्रेट इन टू द जीनोम so the people who have attended the previous session they will be aware with the answer so other audience can if they can answer the question then i'll be glad i hope you have heard this name earlier morpholinos because it it has been covered in your week 2 content so what do you think which is not true regarding to morpholinos you have already seen the structure of morpholino in your lectures so what do you think okay if there is no response then i'll tell you the answer so the correct answer will be can integrate into the genome so the morpholinos they do not integrate to genome they are phosphoro deamidate morpholino oligomers and they are used for the gene knock silencing applications they can block translation but they do not integrate into the genome so let's see in detail that what are morpholinos and let's see so this is the morpholino which i have shown in the yellow colored so what is this so this entire structure is the morpholino rna heteroduplex in which this morpholino has attached to the rna by performing this base pairing so complementary base pairing has been performed here so in this if you see this green region this green ring it is a morpholine ring which replaces the ribose or deoxy ribose sugar so if you see that this base pairing is being performed and if you compare both the structures don't you think it looks similar the structure of rna and morpholino because there is a uh, for example in rna or dna you see the phosphodiester linkages similarly here is also this linkage is somewhat like phosphodiesterase phosphodiester linkage but it is not phosphodiester because there are nitrogens involved so this linkage is the phospho phosphoro deamidate linkage rest this sugar mo sugar molecule that is present in the nucleotide so in this there is a morpholine ring and this morpholine ring is somewhat it is related means it is uh, looking like this ribose sugar that is present in this rna so in this way due to the similarity or you can say this is behaving like a analog so it is behaving like a nucleotide analog due to which the base pairing is occurring between the morpholino and the rna so this morpholino is now binding to rna so this rna won't be able to further translate and in this way it is kind of silencing the rna because it is not allowing it to express so in this uh, i have provided you the information that these morpholino oligos they were devised by james summerton in 1985 and they were developed at the antivirals inclusives and so in 1985 it was developed and these were named because they were assembled from four different subunits so first of all morpholine ring is present that's why they are known as morpholino and oligos because they are combined from different subunit that's why it got the name oligos and it is uh, having the six membered morpholine ring which contain nitrogen and these are about 18 to 25 subunits long and it is not very much long but their length is 18 to 25 subunits and they are present in the specific order and they are joined by the known ionic phosphor diamidate inter subunit linkages and they are used for gene silencing so you can see they are not integrating into the genome they are simply knocking out or knocking down the genome and they are interacting with the genome but not integrating into the genome and there are studies which say that these are the uh, these are behaving like the dna means they look alike dna so these are nucleic acid analogs so nucleic acids are the building blocks of the dna and rna nucleic acid is made up of the nucleotide means it is also known as nucleotide which is made up of a sugar that is ribose or deoxy ribose in the case of dna so here it is a deoxy ribose sugar base and there are four bases uh for example in dna there is thiamine and in rna there is uracil in place of thiamine rest other purines and pyrimidines are the same that is adenine guanine cytosine those three are same in both dna and rna so the morpholinos also contain the same bases that are present in dna and rna and in place of sugars there is a morpholine ring and in place of phosphodiester linkages there is phosphoramidate bonding that is present so this this is the known ionic bond whereas in this case it is negatively charged so this is the main difference 
and they behave like the analogs due to which they are able to bind to the RNA or DNA. But mostly in the silencing, they bind to the RNA instead of DNA. So now let's move to the next question. So I hope it is clear with the previous question. And if you will be having any doubts, then I'll address them in the end. So which one of the following options is true with regard to the step that is highlighted as a red rectangle in the given schematic? So in this, this particular step, you have to mention that what is happening. So the option one is degradation of peptide being made. Option two is degradation of the DNA. Option three is degradation of the viral RNA upon infection. And option four is the RNA-RNA duplex induce degradation of the target RNA. So what do you think? What does it represent, this box? Okay, so if nobody want to answer, then I'll tell you. So this represents the RNA-RNA duplex induced degradation of the target RNA. Now let's see why it is RNA-RNA duplex induced degradation because this particular red molecule in this, if you see their sequence carefully, then you'll see that there are U present here. And it is also in the form of double stranded, it is showing this binding. So if U is present, it means it is RNA molecule because DNA contains thiamine and not the uracil. So this is the RNA. Similarly, it is binding to the another molecule, which is also RNA because in this they have shown that this particular DNA has transcribed to the RNA. And now it could form a GQVA that is the amino acid stretch means which is a peptide you can say not the entire protein. So in this, the binding is happening to the RNA and in this, it has been degraded. So if this particular molecule is binding to RNA, then it is not degrading peptide. It is degrading this RNA. So RNA, RNA duplex induced degradation of target RNA because this region, this particular red region is complementary to this RNA. That's why it is the induced degradation of target RNA because it is targeting certain sequence of RNA, not the other sequence. So that's why its answer will be RNA RNA duplex induced degradation because it is not DNA. It could not, it could not be DNA because it is having uracil. And similarly, peptide is also not degraded because the bond is made with the RNA. So RNA is being degraded here. Madam. Yes. Uh, in this slide, it says RNA RNA are complex. Yeah. So when it is complementary and complex, why it should be degraded it is very happily sitting there. Why we should say it is degraded? It can be stable, more stable. It may not be, it may be inhibited for translation, but it will be sitting there just like that. Why we have to say it is degraded? Okay, so in this case, um, they are particularly focusing on the degradation. So it's not simply the binding, but there are certain enzymes that are also associated here. In this, they have not mentioned, but in this, that they have shown it in the form of dotted dotted line. So in this, they are showing that it is damaged. So when we no, read, I could see the red box. I could see, but yeah. I have to use a lens to see what is there inside. I don't see anything there. If it is degraded, it need not be ordered like that. It may be having a lot of C's, A's, U's, all those things uh, scrambled around. Then I would have said it is degraded, but they have nicely put all those things exactly in one order. I was wondering what is going on with this picture. Uh, I accept the answer, that is not mm -hmm. the issue. Just looking at the picture, I am uh, getting something else. Why it should be degraded and there is no enzyme at all. Uh, uh, in between that and that last picture it shows some uh, green dots and then some uh, 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 something uh, uh, blue and there is no red at all yeah because they are focusing on the end product that is being obtained so irrespective of the 
product which they have. Oh, and so, when it comes and binds, sir, uh, it is uh, very well stabilized so that no enzyme can come and then degrade that. Okay, so when we read the interference, the yeah. so you have read about the small interfering RNAs and micro RNAs. So uh, it stops. It stops. Uh, uh, it's translation. That's what I read. Yeah, if they stop, I was not they stop the translation. So yeah. similarly, there are certain other molecules which when binds to this, so they are very specific for the enzyme, and those enzymes they recognize these sequences and they degrade them. So degradation here in this, they have shown it in the form of dashes because firstly it is the RNA and the RNA, so they are not showing it in the form of the structure because this is very small stretch, which is not adopting any kind of secondary structure. And they are showing the break because uh, these nucleotides, I mean these units, these nucleotides are joined by certain bonds which are phosphodiester linkages. So if certain enzyme comes such as RNAs, so they degrade these linkages that are present. So in that way, that is known as degradation. So in this, this particular red RNA is coming, it is specifically binding to this region and it will further calling certain enzymes due to which this, if you see carefully, then they are showing in the form of nick. There is a damage in the uh, bonds present between the nucleotide because otherwise uh -huh. these nucleotides are joined to one another in the with the help of phosphodiester linkages. So now uh -huh. these linkages are being destroyed and these nucleotides are lying freely in the cytoplasm. So in this way, this RNA is being degraded now. So, so the, only, only only the messenger RNA has been degraded. And this uh, specific RNA which uh, interfere, it will be loitering around somewhere else. That is not degraded. Yeah, means it depends that which, what is the mechanism of action. So there are certain enzymes which specifically bind to this RNA and then degrade the other RNA which is binding to it, which is complementary to this. Whereas there are certain other enzymes which might degrade the entire duplex as well. So it depends that what kind of RNA is there. No, no I don't want to interfere yeah. with your uh, lecture and the presentation. Just out of curiosity, I was uh, questioning, what is this? Uh, this kind of diagram will come to final exam also. Uh, we may not be knowing what is the interpretation of so many things going on. So that's why I was looking at the diagram and then see how to interpret this. Now I understand, no problem. Uh, if the same question comes, I know how to answer. <laughs> Up to that, I am educated now. Thank you, madam. Okay. So, in case if you feel the doubts, means these kind of doubts, and where you are not able to identify the correct option, then one thing you can do, you can neglect the options which are not true. For example, option one, you can easily cancel, means, uh, sorry, option two, you can easily cancel out where they are saying degradation of DNA, because by looking at the sequence, you can see that it is not DNA. So second option is neglected out. Then comes the first option, which is degradation of peptide being made. So it might be confusing at first stage because they are also providing you with the green line as well. So in the next, you can see degradation of viral RNA upon infection. So viral RNA is the foreign RNA that is coming to bind, which is the red in color. So in the red box, they are not showing any degradation for this red, whether it is degraded or not. So we can also reject this option as well. But now the thank confusion you, is you. between first and fourth. Yeah, so that you can see that what kind of degradation is there. So in this way, the fourth option was correct. So let's proceed to the next question without wasting further time. Okay. So the question is, which of the following statements correctly identifies the difference between the global knockout? So the global knockout mouse can be used to study all types of genetic disorders, whereas a conditional knockout mouse can be used to study only metabolic disorders. Option two, a global knockout mouse has a gene deletion in a tissue specific manner, whereas in conditional knockout mouse, one can delete a specific gene at a specific time point. Third option is a global knockout mouse has a gene deletion in all the tissues. Whereas a conditional knockout mouse has a gene deletion in a tissue specific manner. And option four is a global knockout mouse can be used to create the deletion of a gene, while a conditional knockout mouse can be used to create a knock in mouse model only. So, in this, you have to tell that what is the difference between the global knockout and the conditional knockout. So, these were four options. And we have also discussed about these. There are three types of knockouts. 
so we have discussed it in the previous session also so in this you have to tell that which option is correctly means which option is correctly telling about the difference between both of these knockouts and it is uh, clear from the name also global and conditional okay so if there is no response then let's see what will be the correct answer so the correct answer is option number 3 which is saying a global knockout mouse has a gene deletion in all the tissues whereas a conditional knockout mouse has a de gene deletion in a tissue specific manner so it is clear from the name only that global knockout global means entire when we say global it means for the complete so in if the deletion is performed in all the tissues then it will be a global knockout mouse whereas if there are conditions means conditional means there are certain conditions when this knockout is being performed so when in certain tissues only deletion is performed and in other tissues that gene is properly translating so that is known as conditional means there are certain conditions that are imposed in certain conditions only the expression will be suppressed whereas means in certain conditions the uh, expression will be normal whereas in other conditions the operation will be repressed or you can say it is knocked down so let's see the three types of knockouts first so one is um, constitutive knockout mouse or it is also known as global knockout so global knockout means you are completely repressing the gene you are knocking out the gene in all the tissues you do not do not care that which tissue is being in, in which tissue the gene is being knocked out you are knocking out the entire gene means an entire tissues where it is present so this is global knockout whereas there is tissue specific knockout which is known as conditional knockout in which uh, in the rest of the body the gene is functional whereas in specific tissues it is knocked down conditionally and for that we have read about the uh, the means lock p sites that are being present between One the second. region between the target region so i didn't catch that could you try again um, okay sorry so those are the conditional knockouts and then comes inducible knockout mouse so the inducible knockout mouse are the mouse in which uh, whenever you induce so it depends that at which time you want to induce the knockdown so it is means when you provide the inducer then the gene of interest will be it will not be expressed whereas if there is no inducer then it will be functional so there are three types of knockouts and i hope now it is clear that what is the difference between the global and the conditional now let's see the next question so the question is the Excuse genetic me, madam yes in the previous question in the previous slide yeah inducible knockout mouse uh, when you say if you give a particular tissue that inducer you can make the knockout only in the tissue or it will become global so inducer in other words in yeah. other words i have an inducer maybe uv light or maybe laser light in certain tissue if i just shine then there may be some internal uh, uh, mechanism to activate uh, to knock out and automatically that uh, area only it will uh, it will have that one or there may be some chemical or maybe uh, siRNA or whatever it is if we inject then it will be globally uh, making that inducible knockout mouse to be knocked out so i was little uh, you know interested in knowing what is uh, what is meant by inducible knockout whether it can be tissue specific or it has to be global okay so inducible means you are providing with certain yes. inducer and it's in your hand when you are providing it to which tissue you are providing so if you are providing it to specific tissue only and not to other tissues then it will become tissue specific knockout and if you will provide it to the all the tissues then it will become global knockout because the principle here is that if inducer is present then only this um, gene of interest will be knocked out it will not be able to express so it depends on you that when uh, to which uh, place you are providing this inducer and at what time you are providing because generally it is used because it is used when you have to take the time means at particular time you have to take the readings 
Okay. But that you can't use tissue specific because for in the tissue specific case, it will be for the entire tissue, it will be repressed. But in inducible, you can also perform at the like at the different time scales. So you can knock out particular knock out the gene in the tissue at particular point of time, and then insert in other tissue at some other point of time, and then see the differences. So it depends that when you are providing inducers, so in that way, definition will be changed. Okay, so the next question is the genetic editing tools that is CRISPR Cas9 uses the guide RNA. The guide RNA is a so now you have to tell that what is this guide RNA. So option one is it is RNA sequence that helps in identifying the target DNA locus where it makes a double stranded break. Option two is an RNA protein complex that anchors the endonucleases to the target DNA. Option three is RNA protein dimer that helps in the formation of Cas9 complex. And option four is an RNA protein complex that guides the restriction endonucleases to identify the target DNA segment. So now you have to tell that what is the guide RNA. Okay, so I think for today's session, nobody is responding by unmuting their mics. It's fine. So let's see. I can, I can respond because I already know the answer. Yeah, you already I don't know. want to respond. I don't want to respond for that reason. Yeah, for you, I know that you already have gone through these questions. It's okay if you uh, don't want to unmute and say, then let's uh, see what will be the correct answer. So the correct answer is. RNA sequence that helps in identifying the target DNA locus where it makes a double stranded break. So now let's see what is guide RNA. So from here it is being clear that as the name suggests guide RNA, so it means it is guiding something. So let's see its entire functions. So if you see here, this firstly this blue colored body is the Cas9 enzyme and this is the guide RNA which is written as sgRNA so sgRNA is nothing what is this it is a sing, single guide RNA and if you see it is a long it is a RNA molecule first of all and then if you see here it is binding to a target sequence so it is a means it is a RNA sequence that helps you to bind to the target sequence that is present in certain gene and then CRISP means this Cas9 will come and it will uh, recognize this guide RNA and then further it will perform certain breaking and then later on DNA means our, uh, the cells will be performing some repair mechanisms using the known homologous and joining or homology directed repair and ultimately the those means cut will be healed. So in the case of known homologous and joining there could be certain disruptions there could be insertions deletions or substitutions that could occur. So it is quite error prone repair, whereas the homology directed repair, it is based on the another molecule that is homologous or another sequence that is homologous, which is acting as a donor template. So in this case, if you provide the donor template with the homologous sequences, in this case, they are provided with the homologous sequences at the end. So now these homologous sequences are present, so it will be able to fuse here. They will perform certain, there will be recombination occurring at this level and this DNA will be incorporated here. So it will be converted into a single DNA duplex. So this is all about the guide RNA. And now if we look at the CRISPR-Cas9, at how it works. So firstly, we need to design the guide RNA. And for this, we select and design a guide RNA sequence that targets the specific gene or genomic region, which we want to edit. And then comes uh, delivering with the CRISPR components so we introduce this guide RNA and Cas9 proteins into the target cells or the organism using the method such as transfection or viral vectors. And then Cas9 cleavages will be performed by the, this is the Cas9 is an enzyme which is involved in the cleavage. So firstly guide RNA will bind to the target sequence and then it will attract Cas9 towards it. Cas9 will form complex and then it will perform this cuts. If you see it is performing double strand breaks. So this all is done by this Cas9 enzyme. It is performing the double strand break. 
and then the any repair mechanisms will take over and there are two types of repair mechanisms one is this non homologous unshunning and another one is homology directed repair and ultimately in the end we'll verify and analyze we'll confirm that if gene editing which we are want which we wanted to perform whether it is successful or not so we can verify that in the end so this is how this entire crispr cas9 gene editing process is being performed and here if you see then this is the guide rna it is the linker loop and this is the uh, tracer rna so it is nothing but it is the transcriptional uh, so it is the active uh, cr rna that is crispr rna so this molecule is uh simply helping to bind with the cas9 it is providing stability to this guide rna I means this single guide rna so this region of this guide rna is known as crispr rna that is cr rna in the short form and this is known as tra cr rna which is providing stability to this entire guide rna so if we say if we see carefully then we'll see this complete single guide rna is made up of two units in which one unit has a role in binding to the target sequence wherever uh, other unit is involved with the linkage with the cas9 so this particular rna is driving the complex formation with the cas9 enzyme which is ultimately leading to this cut which has been produced so first of all how this crispr cas9 system came into play so uh, it was observed that in the case of bacteria such as streptococcus so they protect them from the bacteriophages by using this mechanism so what happened is why this technique got the name crispr cas9 so uh, crispr is nothing but these are the short interspersed elements these are short interspersed palindromic sequences so if you see here there is certain bacteriophage that is infecting the cell so bacteriophage is simply the viruses that infects the bacteria so now this bacteriophage has infected this bacteria it has put inside the viral dna now what bacteria does is it recognizes this viral dna there are two enzymes cas1 cas2 they are performing certain cuts and there are certain palindromic sequences that are present in the bacterial dna so in between that these spacer regions so in this this particular viral dna is being incorporated and the sites that are present uh, means these this site where this viral dna is incorporated these are known as crispr locus which have uh, short interspersed palindromic regions so these regions are palindromes and to these regions only this particular viral dna will be inserted and then spacers and tra cr rna is transcribed and this tra cr rna it will bind wherever means this palindrome region wherever it will find the palindrome region it will bind to that and this particular binding will form the pre cr rna that is pre crispr rna and further it will call the rna enzymes that will degrade this so after rna processing this guide rna and the cas9 complex will be formed which will specifically target this viral dna it will break that viral dna and in this way this means particular this is a defense mechanism to destroy this viral dna by the bacteria so after this it was Uh, came into play that how this crispr cas9 is dealing with the viral dna so the people uh, began to take interest that how we can also use this to cut down certain genes or to alter certain genes to edit certain genes so in this way it was the beginning of the crispr cas9 so in this the spacers are the fragments of viral dna which are shown in these colors and the regions which is means this crispr locus so these gray colored regions are nothing but these are the palindromic sequences and palindrome means the sequences which are read from means we read from forward and then we read from backward then they are the similar in means so they are similar and the definition means for the crispr is clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats so these are repeats that's why this region got the name crispr it is involving the cas enzyme that's why this technique got the name crispr cas9 now there are different uh, means this crispr cas9 is also used for certain treatments nowadays so in human because in other models it has been used and it has been successfully known that it is able to edit the genes whereas in case of human disease it has been used in the sickle cell anemia where it is used for the correction of mutations in the patient derived cells so it is at the level of preclinical studies where it has shown promising results 
but still clinical trials are means they are going on to means completely verify the results then came beta thalassemia so for that also uh, they have used crispr cas9 for the gene corrections and it is also at the level of pre clinical studies and early phase uh, clinical trials have been explored and they said that the results are feasible then for cystic fibrosis also research is going on to correcting to correcting the underlying genetic mutations and it is also at the level of pre clinical studies and clinical uh, trials are at the early stages then duckin muscular dystrophy for that also for correcting the gene dystrophy in this this precas9 technique is being used and it has shown good results at the pre clinical levels whereas ulti uh, early phase uh, clinical trials have been commenced not started yet then liber congenital amaurosis so it is a form of inherited blindness for this also crispr cas9 was being used to correct specific mutation in the eye and early phase clinical trials are being going on so it has also shown potential in improving the vision in certain patients but further research is still going on so this crispr cas9 is majorly used for edit the gene and we'll also see in the end that how different gene manipulation techniques are being developed and how these are helping us and what other things we can do with the help of these gene manipulation techniques so gene editing techniques because it, these are not just uh, knocking down the expression of the gene but they are also altering the sequence so we will see all those things in the end but for here now i hope you are clear that what is the guide rna and what role it is playing so let's move to the next question so the question is which one of the following options is a true statement for the homologous recombination process so now in this you have to tell that what is true about homologous recombination process so option 1 is it is a type of genetic recombination in which nucleotide sequences are exchanged between two similar or identical molecules of dna option 2 is it occurs during the formation of the egg and sperm cells option 3 is it mostly occurs between the homologous chromosomes bearing distinct markers surrounding the exchange region and option 4 is all of the above or all of these so what do you think what what would be the correct statement for the homologous recombination i hope you are clear with the term recombination okay so nobody is answering today okay so now let's see what will be the correct answer for this so the answer is all of these so if we see if we say homologous recombination then it means that it is the kind of genetic recombination which is occurring within the nucleotide sequences between the two similar or identical molecules of dna because it is homologous homologous means similar so it occurs during the formation of egg and sperm cells and it mostly occurs between the homologous chromosomes which may bear distinct markers surrounding the exchange regions it is not always that will always have distinct markers the means markers could be same as well but mostly they are distinct now let's see in detail that what is homologous recombination so in this i have provided you a very detailed view so you do not need to remember all the genes it is just for your reference so these uh, first of all this homologous recombination is a method which our cells use to repair the dna when there is certain breaks due to ionizing radiations but not just uh, this the recombination is also occurring at the level of the formation of egg or sperm cells also so the that process is also recombination to generate certain recombinants or certain new variations so that is also the role of this recombination but other than that it has role in the repair also so if there is double strand breaks then there are certain enzymes which comes into play and they perform they could choose uh, homologous and non homologous and joining one method among them so in the case of homologous recombination uh, there is a requirement for the another homologous sequence or the homologous chromosome that should be ha that should have the identical sequence to that of the sequence which we have means which has undergone the damage so these enzymes further recognize those sequences so it will degrade um, 
one of the sequence and for the another sequence it will generate the overhangs and then it will compare it means there will be the comparisons between this homologous sequence and the sequence which have undergone undergone the break so wherever there will be the complementarity will be present so in that case homology is searched and strand is invade strand invasion is being performed in which the strand of this damaged is being invaded to the new uh, or you can say the homologous chromosome that is present so to that it is invading and now the dna polymerase will come and they will extend this uh, region so extension will be performed so this is known as synthesis in which the nucleotides are synthesized after the invasion and then after synthesis the heteroduplex extension will be performed so this particular strand will be now extended so now both of the duplexes are being synthesized now we have to separate both the duplexes so for that in the case of dissolution and then resolution the those two steps will be performed in which this particular duplexes two duplexes will be separated or this step is also you can say it is also known as the branch shifting so there is the holiday junction there is a term which is known as holiday junction so that is nothing but when this particular if you say this um, where this crossover has been performed when this is directing in the four different direction that is known as the holiday junction so after this holiday junction has been performed then after that there is the resolution step which comes and which separates those two duplexes from one another so now you obtain one uh, duplex that is non crossover and the another duplex that is having this crossover section also in it so in this way the homologous recombination works and these are two steps and so i have pro provided you with the detailed step if you want to read and i don't know I means these are not involved in your syllabus so don't worry you need not to go into the detail and now let's uh, also look into the another kind of repair that is non homologous end joining other than this homologous repair so in this case you do not require any complementary or homologous dna sequence instead you simply ligate these two uh, means this cut you ligate this cut so for that you use certain other enzyme and then this particular break is being processed it is ligated in certain cases certain enzymes could also uh, break this double stranded dna further due to which there will be deletion of certain uh, nucleotides and then there if you provide with the certain nucleotide certain enzyme then it could also incorporate new nucleotides then there could be insertion and then there are also certain enzymes which uh, perform the substitution that if particular nucleotide was present then it could be substituted as well so in nhcj means that is non homologous end joining you do not need any complementary or homologous sequence and you simply ligate the damaged strands and there could be three outcomes insertions duplication uh, sorry insertions deletion and substitution whereas in homologous repair you are completely synthesizing the stretch you are not losing anything for example if there is certain cut then you are also introducing certain gene or certain region in between that because you are taking the help of the homologous dna sequence and in this i have shown that uh, when this uh, recombination is performed at the level of means in the cells also it is being performed when we have read that in the sperms or eggs it is also performed so here if you see there is the two copies of chromosome that is present in the cell one is paternal and one is maternal and this after means as soon as the dna is being replicated now meiotic recombination will happen so uh, the cell will enter into the division phase in which there will be prophase so in the prophase the there is particular pachyotene stage where this crossing over happens and this crossing over results in the recombinant so that's why it is also in some places it is also known as recombination so after the first division the recombinant products will be obtained and after second division there will it will be uh, divided into four daughter cells so in this there is partial exchange between the maternal and paternal chromosomes so in this very combination is also occurring in the formation of sperm or egg cells which was mentioned in the option so if you see it is happening in the meiosis so i have a question for you that what do you think that recombination also operates in the mitosis also or it is only happening in the meiosis what do you think
Does anyone want to answer? Okay. So this um, recombination, it is mostly in that it is only happening in the case of meiosis. It is not observed in the case of mitosis because mitosis is the equational division and this uh, recombination leads to the uh, offspring which have a different kind of products or different offspring. There is change in the partial change in the chromosomal content, but in mitosis there is no such change. So recombination is not observed in the mitosis and it is mainly observed in the meiosis. So uh, there is uh, another confusion. Most people confuse between recombination and crossing over because uh, these terms are used interchangeably. So when we say recombination, when it is the production of different combination of alleles in the offspring, whereas when we say crossing over in the during the cell division, so it is the exchange of the genetic material between the non-sister chromatids. So in this uh, statement, they are almost similar that they are leading to certain change among the two units. So crossing over leads to genetic recombination. So the product of crossing over is the recombination and uh, how the crossing over is being performed. So there are synapses that are being performed that are being produced during the cell division. So synapses is nothing but the two uh, non-sister chromatids, they come over one another and they form a region which is known as chiasmata. So that is the site where crossing over is happening that is known as synapses. So the recombination is producing the genetic variation among the offspring and work as a repair mechanism for double strand breaks during the meiosis. Whereas this crossing over is only occurring at the specific sites that are known as chiasmata and it is exerting and it exerts to the genetic recombination between the chromosomes. So it is uh, simply for the exchanging of the segments and means the crossing over is not always leading to re generation of recombinants. Crossing over can also happen but uh, no recombinants could be generated or unequal crossing over could also be um, means could also be uh, happening so this is a little difference between recombination and crossing over so recombination is a bigger term and crossing over here's is a what i found shorter term so now let's see the mechanism of crossing over so in the prophase one it happens and specifically in the patchetine stage of the prophase one so these are the known sister chromatids and it formed tetrads where the two homologous chromosomes are lying closer to one another. Now the chiasma is a site where the crossing over has to happen. So in this way, they are coming over one another. And now the in the metaphase one, this uh, crossing over has been performed in the pachetin state. So now uh, the two homologous chromosomes are containing certain fragments from uh, two different uh, things from their neighbors. So now they are recombinants that are being produced. So if this particular chromosome will further separate into two chromatids. So now if you see the four daughter cells are being produced, this division is meiosis. So four daughter cells are produced. So two daughter cells have recombinants, whereas two have the parental types. So in this way, uh, the two have the means two are not undergoing crossing over, whereas two have undergone crossing over. So in this way, the result is recombination of the means the recombination is the uh, result that is generated after crossing over and crossing over is only occurring at the chiasma where that site means where the synapses is being performed whereas recombination can occur anywhere it is not specifically happening at the synapses or the chiasma site so that is also one of the point whereas crossing over is happening to change the segments between two chromosomes whereas recombination can happen to generate new functions as well as to uh, means repair the DNA or the damage that happened in DNA to repair that. So this is the difference between both of them. Now let's move to the next question. So the question is which one of the following most appropriately describes the classical central dogma of biology? So you have to tell that which one of them is correct about central dogma of biology. So option one is protein, RNA, DNA. Then RNA to protein to DNA, then DNA to RNA to protein, and then DNA to protein to mRNA. So in this, there is uh, greater than arrows represents the means directionality of the flow set from where the information is flowing because central dogma is nothing but it tells you the flow of information that is universally accepted. So you have to tell that which among the four options would be correct, which correctly defines the central dogma of biology.
This is quite simple, means you can answer this. Let me check it. Okay. Okay, few students are answering in the chat. So Gangotri is right. Now let's see. So the correct answer is option three, that is DNA to RNA to protein. So now let's see what is central dogma of biology. So the central dogma of biology, it says it is a theory which states that genetic information flows only in one direction that is from DNA to RNA to protein or RNA directly to protein. So this central dogma defines the flow of information only in the one direction. But there are certain exceptions to this view because there are certain viruses which converts their RNA to DNA that is known as reverse transcription. So this uh, firstly let's talk about the central dogma. So this fundamental theory was given by Francis Crick in 1958 and his version is a bit global and it includes that information does not flow from proteins to nucleic acids. So he says that proteins are not going to make nucleic acids but nucleic acids can make proteins. So in this both DNA and RNA can form protein, but protein won't convert to DNA again. But there are exceptions such as prions. So these are the infectious proteins which replicate without going through RNA or DNA intermediates. So they are also replicating themselves. So uh, and they are also responsible for the neurological disease that is Creutzfeldt Jakob, which is uniformly uh, lethal that causes the degeneration of nervous system. And not just prions, but there are other uh, viruses also there which are converting their RNA to DNA and there are certain other experiments which say that RNA is also replicating to RNA itself. So now if you see here, so what the central dogma say that DNA can uh, replicate to form DNA using the polymerase, DNA polymerase. So the arrows which are represented in this orange color, they are the normal arrows which says that usually this process is being observed. Whereas the arrows which are shown in green, which shows the unusual processes, which are the exceptions to the central dogma. So according to central dogma, the DNA can convert to DNA, it can replicate and it can form its copies. So that step is known as replication. Whereas this DNA can also transcribe, it can form RNA by using the process transcription where DNA is converting to RNA. And then this RNA can also convert to proteins, which is known as the process of translation. But there are certain exceptions such as viruses where the RNA is converted to DNA by the process of reverse transcription by the enzymes reverse transcriptase. Then there are certain other uh, viruses also which uh, converts the sense RNA to the negatively sense RNA. So there is the replication at the level of RNA as well, not just at the DNA level. And then there are other RNA dependent RNA polymerases which are also involved in conversion of negative sense to positive sense RNA. So these are few exceptions and prions are also one of the exception which do not undergo this RNA DNA thing and they are self replicating proteins. So in this way these are exceptions but if we look at the global acceptance then we see that these are these exceptions are very few they are not majorly observed that's that's why this a theory of central dogma is being accepted and this is being uh, universally accepted and it is believed that information is mostly or in the ma major cases it is flowing in the one direction only and the, there are very few exceptions so those can be ignored so now let's move to the next question so this question says which one of the following approaches cannot be used to study the transcriptome so now i hope you are aware about the term transcriptome it's clear from its name only that if you are studying the transcripts or the RNA. So now you have to tell which of the techniques are not used for the study of the transcripts. So option one is RNA-seq, option two is microarray, option three is RT-PCR and option four is pedigree analysis. So what do you think? Which one approach cannot be used for the transcriptome, transcriptome studies? Okay. 
Okay, so the students which are having doubts, so I will give you enough time in the end. Means there are very few questions which are left now, so we'll take your doubts in the end after covering all the questions. Don't worry. Okay, so if there are no answers to this question, then let's see. So the correct option is pedigree analysis because the rest all the three methods they are used for the transcriptome analysis. So it's clear from the name only RNA seq, RNA sequencing. So it is also involved with the RNA. Then comes microarray. So they are also uh, means helpful in identifying the gene expressions. So they are also means binding to the RNA segments. Then comes RT-PCR. So it is also beginning with the RNA sequence in your hand and then you are converting it into the cDNA and then following the PCR procedures. But the pedigree analysis is only exception because it is not um, means uh, helping you to study the transcriptome. So now let's see what the pedigree analysis say. So pedigree analysis is the analysis in which you see the pedigrees, the diagrams. So the pedigrees, this is the pedigree in which you see how the particular gene is being inherited. So in this, you look at the family relationships by giving, by drawing certain symbols, which represents the people and lines and which, which tells about the genetic relationships. And then you infer that what kind of inheritance pattern it is following. So in this, you determine the mode of inheritance. Either it is dominant, recessive, partial dominance, sex-linked, autosomal, mitochondrial or maternal effects. You determine the probability of the affected offspring for a given cross. So these are four types of inheritance patterns. There are others as well. So by looking at these diagrams, you can say that what is the kind, what kind of inheritance pattern you see. So for this, you uh, study the populations, you study the families that which people had disease. And in that way, there are certain symbols which are defined for certain traits. You draw them and then you observe that what kind of relationship is being present between the uh, generations and then you say that this kind of inheritance pattern is being followed so that means the gene is present in this particular type of chromosome whether it is x-linked y-linked or autosomal so all those things you can understand by using the pedigree analysis but it is at no step it is telling you about the transcriptome so that's why it was the option that is not telling you about the transcriptome so now let's move to the next question so which one of the following options correctly identifies the stepwise progress in the positional cloning approach? So in the previous session also we talked about positional cloning. Then in CFTR also we learned that how the scientists use CFTR means how they used CRISPR, clo uh, sorry, positional cloning to identify the disease gene. So in this you have to tell what is the stepwise progress in, the, in this approach. So option one is genetic mapping transcript mapping, gene sequencing and physical mapping. So these greater than symbols represents the flow. So in the second option, genetic mapping, then physical mapping, then transcript mapping, then gene sequencing. In option three, physical mapping, then transcript mapping, then gene sequencing, and then genetic mapping. And option four is genetic mapping, transcript mapping, physical mapping, and gene sequencing. So you have to tell which, is, which one is the correct order or which one is the uh, correct steps that are being followed during the positional cloning approach. Okay, then let's see the answer. So the correct answer is genetic mapping, then physical mapping, then transcript mapping, and then gene sequencing. So in positional cloning, you look for the means you check that uh, where that gene could be present and then you go at the level of sequence. So you proceed with the mapping the gene and then physically mapping it and then later on and uh, means entering the gene sequencing phase. So let's see. So in this pedigree analysis that will help you to, um, to map the gene that what kind of inheritance pattern it follows. Either it is present on the X chromosome, Y chromosome or the autosomes. So in that way, you will be able to know the uh, map means uh, the location of the gene. Then you will perform physical mapping, which will tell you the exact um, location of the particular gene that at which chromosome it is present. And then you can also go for the transcript mapping. And after transcript mapping, you can be doing the gene sequencing because now you have obtained the exact means you have uh, now shortened the set 
because you had the longer chromosome. Firstly, you had the information of the entire chromosome that this particular chromosome is involved. Then in the physical mapping, you have also undergone to the location level in the chromosome that at which sites that particular gene could be present. Then in transcript mapping, you have limited that entire set at the to the gene level. And after that gene level information you have obtained, then you go for the sequencing so that you can compare that gene sequence with the normal person. So in this way, or the normal or wild type sequence. So in this way, the positional cloning works. It tells you about the notations or variations that have occurred in particular sequence by beginning with the phenotype and moving on to the genotype. Then comes the next question. Okay, so its answer is already visible. So uh, the question is genetic manipulations in mouse models can help us to understand. Option one is redundant gene functions. Option two is gene mutations that are embryonic lethal. Option three is disease pathology and option four is all of these. So genetic manipulations in mouse models. So these are the the modifications that are performed at the level of genes. So what can we understand from these? So the correct option is the all of these. And why all of these? Because uh, first is redundant gene functions. So when we uh, perform the knockdown constructs, all those constructs, so they help us to know the redundant gene functions because for example, there are two genes which are performing the, which are generating the same protein and which are showing certain phenotype. So now if you knock down one gene, but if you still observe the phenotype, so that means there is certain other gene that is also present and which is uh, leading to the generation of the phenotype. So in that case, that is known as redundant gene functions. So that you can know with the help of genetic manipulations in the mouse model. Then gene mutations that are embryonic lethal. So there are certain mutations which are lethal. So in that case, if you uh, knock down that gene in all the tissues, then that mouse, that embryo will die. It will not survive. So those mutations also you can study in the case of mouse models uh, because you cannot apply it to the human models. So in the mouse models, you can also see that if the embryo is dying, so those mutations are embryonically lethal. They can also be observed by using the mouse models. Then you can also see the disease pathology that if particular gene is uh, involved in certain expression of certain protein, if that gene is knocked out, so it is leading to certain disease. So the disease pathology also you can perform using the genetic manipulations in the mouse models. Now let's see uh, what else we can obtain with the use of these transgenic mouse models. So we can model the development of human disease in a controlled environment. For example, if we know a certain gene that is responsible for a particular disease. So what we can do is in the mouse also, we can study that gene that we can perform certain mutations and observe that what is the effect of particular mutation in the functionality of that gene because it is not possible to do it at the, in the, at the humans. So we perform it in the mouse because mouse serve as a good model because it, uh, it shows similarity to the human. It is orthologous to a human. That's why we use the mouse models. Then we can also test possible new drug treatments and get faster results in the mouse. We can also target means we can also target means specifically target the genes to study. We can also replicate specific characteristics, symptoms or pathology of the disease. So all those things can be performed on these mouse. And then if you see here, so for example, you have certain clinically evaluation, you evaluated certain disease in humans. Now you know which gene is involved. You have performed gene, genetic analysis and assessment of gene expression. You have identified the disease responsible gene. You have genetic markers that are segregating with the disease symptoms and genes modifying symptoms and disease outcomes. All you have, for all you have the information. Now what you can do, you can knock out or knock in the mice by repressing that particular gene or by activating certain genes. So those modifications that you perform in the mice, whereas you can also perform the temporal specific overexpression of unique or modified genes. So you, you can use different constructs. You can conditionally knock out or you can globally knock out or you can induce means induce based knocked out. So all those things you can perform on mouse models and ultimately you can confirm the function of the gene as the part of disease pro process that there are certain genes which are only uh, represent certain tissues and which lead to neuro neurological disorders. 
whereas in other tissues it is normally expressed so those studies you can perform in mouse models very easily so all those things you can see that uh, by using the conditional knockdown you can see uh, in which tissues that particular gene is being repressed and then it leads to certain disease so those patterns you can uh, replicate in the mouse then creation of user friendly mammalian models of human pathophysiology because it is related to humans so and it is also user friendly you don't have to struggle with this so that's why these uh, mouse models are generally used and it can also help you with the pharmaceutical and small molecules development you can test different drugs on mouse and then you can check for the uh, efficacy of those drugs and then later on you can also use it in humans and after the clinical trials the drug will be accepted so in this way this small mouse has a lot of applications in this disease pathologies and new drug discoveries okay so now let's uh, talk about the gene manipulations because in this we we means read about the gene manipulations that are performed on the mouse models but in this you are designing the constructs so now to simplify this process because this is a longer process so there are certain other uh, enzymes which you can use to alter the sequence or the alter the genes that are present you can repress them instead of designing the construct which is a time consuming process so this is uh, this uh, shows different kind of enzymes or different methods of gene manipulations so here i've shown the meganucleases zinc finger nucleases telin and then currently crispr cas9 so these are nothing but these have the nucleases uh, units which digest the dna so in this you can specifically knock out certain gene with the help of this you can alter the gene expression so uh, when we say mega nucleases so these are the older nucleases that were present and we could modify them genetically engineer them so these are nothing but these are the genetically engineered nucleases so if we genetically enge engineer them because these nucleases have two units one is nucleus subunit and one is dna binding subunit so if we modify the dna binding sub dna binding domain or dna binding subunit then it will bind to a specific dna for example like uh, restriction endonucleases they have a, a specific target sequence or specific recognition sequence to which it binds and then produces cuts so similarly those have also certain recognition sites to which they bind with the help of the uh, dna binding domains so similarly we can alter these domains by changing their sequence so we can change the sequence in such a way that it binds a certain target so by modifying that we can uh, now uh, knock down or we can now produce cut in the desired regions in the genome so the zinc finger nucleases are one such example in which the dna binding domain was changed and it was provided with the motif that is zinc finger motif that's why it got its name zinc finger nucleases so it recognizes the zinc, uh, uh, zinc finger motif and then it binds to it and then it produces the cut with the help of its uh, nucleus part so this there was the enzyme which is the fork one in which this particular uh, dna binding domain has been replaced now it has been altered so in this way it will bind and produce the cut very specifically and it is engineered similarly talens are also one of the engineered enzymes engineered nucleases which bind to specific sequences which are desired target sequences and they'll produce double strand breaks and then our machinery means then our cellular machinery will come it will repair those breaks and then whenever any damage is repaired then it is not always that it will be corrected means it will be uh, completely corrected 100% it will be uh, means it will go back to its normal state there are certain cases where the repair is not means 100% feasible it's leading to certain changes it can cause insertions deletions or gene disruption so in uh, non homology based and joining there are certain deletions that can happen or insertions that can happen which can disrupt the gene whereas in homology directed repair if you provide with the certain template then you can insert the dna of your choice within that particular uh dna sequence which you have, in which you have produced produced the cut so this crispr cas9 is the currently it is the hot topic so these zinc finger nucleases and telin for them you must have the information about the target region to which you want to bind so these are a little bit feasible because these are lesser feasible than crispr cas9 because uh, for this you must 
have the information about the target sequence to which uh, they will bind and then they can also um, lead to the means they bind to the bigger sequences so that's why there was a difficulty to find such sequences in the genome and if the sequence is very small then it could bind anywhere in the dna and it could produce multiple cuts so to deal with the zinc finger nucleosin tlms was a bit difficult so then this crispr cas9 came into play which has this um, guide rna molecule which binds to the region so it binds to the target region and then it uh, cas9 will come it will form the complex and it will digest the molecule specifically and in this uh, the target sequence need not to be exactly similar to that of the sequence to which it binds which was in the case of zinc finger nucleosin and talin that's why this crispr cas9 is better than these two methods and it is more feasible it is more acceptable in today's time so these all are editing dna these all are producing double strand breaks it can also produce single strand break as well and then if there is no donor template so what happens here is uh for example you want to remove certain gene and insert the corrected form of that gene so or you want to insert some other gene so for that you can provide a template with the gene of interest and then after homology directed repair it will incorporate that gene into the place where you have produced the cut so in this way you can alter the uh, you can perform the site directed integration and in the case of uh, non homologous end joining you can see there is site directed mutagenesis so site directed mutagenesis means the site is directed by you because you are uh, specifically producing the breaks in this particular region means the target region so it is site directed and mutagenesis because there are certain changes in the dna sequence that's why it is mutagenesis it can either be deletion insertion or substitution so these three can be the result of non homologous end joining and then in the homologous and uh, homologous uh, directed repair you could insert certain region so that could be a long homolog homology donor in which you uh, insert the longer gene or you can also insert the shorter gene depending on you depending on your interest so it is site directed integration so you are means at particular site you are directing some uh, complementary gene or some new gene so that is site directed integration so these two things you can perform by using these uh, methods for gene editing and in this uh, this is the elaborated thing with how this uh, zfn it is producing the double strand breaks it is binding to two different dna means two individual uh, strands of the dna duplex and in this way talin is also producing double strand breaks and here i have shown the uh, crispr cas9 mechanism where the guide rna is binding to the gene of interest to the target dna and the cas9 is coming and then it is producing the double strand breaks and ultimately uh, repair mechanism are working so we can reprogram the gene and it can be used for the farm animals if you want to produce or if you want to increase certain yield so in that case we can provide more genes because uh, if we provide more genes then it will express more protein so in that way we can increase the production of certain proteins whereas we can also use it in the embryos or in the immunoplurotent stem cells or in the stem cells or to improve the crops so all those things can be um, performed by the manipulating the genes by using these three methods and how does this crispr cas9 works so we have already discussed that it was firstly it was observed in the bacteria that they were using it for the, their defense mechanisms and it was having the cas9 enzyme which is using this guide rna to uh, specifically identify the target gene and then binding to it then this uh, guide rna is forming complex with cas9 and this cas9 is having the nucleus activity by which it is producing the double strand breaks and these um, there are these pam sequences in which this particular cut means it defines that after certain regions upstream the cut will be produced so the target sequence cut off and then you can insert desired dna depending on your need or means if you want to insert some gene or whether you do not want to insert so it depends on you you can provide with the desired dna sequence along with the complementary region means along with the homologous region so that it can undergo homology dependent repair so in that way you can incorporate certain region and you can also remove the unwanted gene and insert the desired sequence 
and then this similar thing is being uh, similar information is being provided that how this crispr cas9 um, will help you to either add certain genes or disrupt certain genes or correct certain genes and these are the samples or these are the cells which uh, for which you can use this crispr cas9 method and then it was also i mean checked in the mice models and they were checked that whether this crispr cas9 editing is helpful or not so firstly you can apply it to the mice models you can analyze it and then you can use it for the human models as well and in the case of plants this crispr cas9 editing has helped in the generating the plant disease resistance then abiotic stress tolerance then fruit and berry quality improvement root flower and fruit color modifications and there are many more things many more applications of this crispr cas9 gene editing methods but there are certain challenges so it provides us various opportunities such as targeted medicines biofuels disease resistant crops new industrial products so all those things we can obtain by manipulating the genes modifying the genes but there are certain challenges first of all safety because as i've talked in my uh, few slides back that this crispr cas9 is now being used for the disease genes in which it is targeting those disease genes it is removing those disease genes and replacing them with the correct genes so that the correct product is being expressed now but those all um, things are in the clinical trial phase so we do not know that at the later stage will it be uh, means uh, will it be stable or uh, means maybe it could lead to some other problems because you are doing it by you are editing it some you are going against the nature so it's safety you do not know it's a big challenge then there are ethical concerns because many people believe that if you are interfering with the natural products and it may have some ethical concerns for example to increase the yield of certain uh, livestock or the cattle you are providing you are giving them certain your transgenic products you are providing them you are generating transgenic animals or plants so that is wrong that is that have some ethical issues ethical concerns and then there are certain regulatory challenges because many of the things which could be obtained by genetically modifying so they could uh, impose certain harm in the future that's why certain uh, means administrations or ministries they ban those products so there are certain regulatory challenges that is being faced by these methods so this is all about today's session now i'll be taking your doubts if you have regarding the week 2 content or about these slides okay so let's begin okay somebody is somebody has asked that how are specific genome isolations done okay so um, first of all specific genome isolations it could have multiple meanings so specific in term of what specific in term of genetic material that specific to human microbes means bacteria fungi viruses or it is specific to certain tissues or means what specificity you are mentioning here uh, because if you are talking about the specific tissues then we'll be obtaining sample from specific tissues and then we are isolating the genome from those tissues because there are certain uh, disease which um, there are certain uh, diseases which have the repression of genes in that particular tissue so in that case we can obtain that uh, sample from that tissue by, by performing tissue biopsy and then we'll check for the genome that we can sequence that genome and we can compare it with the normal genome and we can see that what kind of mutations are occurring in that tissue whereas if it is in the term of uh, microbes then in that case you will take the sample which uh, for which there is very least chance of host genome being present in it so in that case you will take the uh, sample then you will uh, perform the gen next generation sequencing and then you will uh, so now if uh, you have performed the next generation sequencing you have obtained the sequence so now that particular sequences which you have obtained will have the host dna along with the other dnas as well you will have the dna of microbiome in which there will be bacterial dna fungi dna or viruses dna depending that what kind of uh, organisms that are present in that particular sample so in that case what you will do now you have the sequence 
Now, firstly, it depends what kind of sequencing technique you have used. There are certain techniques which sequence only smaller DNA fragments. So now you have only smaller fragments. So you have to assemble them to generate a complete genome sequence. So you assemble them. And then after assembly, you get an entire genome sequence. So all those genome sequences now you have obtained. Now what you will perform, you will use the bioinformatic methods in which you will be aligning those uh, sequences to the already available genome sequences. And you'll see that to which uh, genome sequence it is giving more uh, hits or more aligned to more similarity or more identity it is giving. So with that, you can see that this particular genome is coming from bacteria or fungi or virus. So in that way, you identify that what is the genome that is present. Okay, it's, uh, it's okay if you can type. Okay, so the students whose mic is not working, they can easily type and I'll answer to that by reading it. So, uh, so if Mark has another doubt, then you can also type because uh, means I am not clear with your question. But if it was in the terms of tissues and microbes, so that I have answered. If you still have the doubt, then you can type it. Okay, so the next question was, are there other oligos like morpholinos used in the similar research? Okay, so as the morpholinos, so they are also binding to the, um, means they can bind to the RNA and then further they are stopping or they are, they are uh, means uh, slowing down the translation process. So similarly, like morpholinos, we could also design certain other oligos. But uh, currently, I'm not sure about other oligos that are present, but there are other methods which are used to um, perform gene silencing, such as small interference RNA and micro RNAs. They are being used for silencing the gene for certain RNA fragments. So we can also means design certain oligos which behave like the nucleotide analogs, which can easily bind or interact with the DNA or RNA by having the base. So if we can uh, replicate that thing, if we can design the analogs, then yes, uh, we can generate the morpholino kind of oligos. But as of now, there are I mean there is no information regarding the other oligos like morpholinos. But there is information regarding the RNA molecules, uh, which interferes with the gene expression, which silence the gene. So that information is available. Then. Uh, Okay, so how splicing is different from alternative splicing and how can alternative splicing directly converts an intron to an exon? Okay, so firstly, let's answer your first question. So how is splicing different from alternative splicing? So when we say splicing, it is a broader term. Splicing means removal of introns and then joining of exons because introns are the known coding regions and exons are the coding regions. So what is happening is that in the premature RNA, after splicing, these introns are being removed. So that is splicing. Splicing is a process. But alternative splicing is this it is a category of splicing in which what is happening is that alternative uh, uh, transcripts are being generated. For example, if there are three exons and two introns are in between them, so there are chances where the uh, so for example, exon is one, two, and three. So there are chances one. Uh, so splicing happen in such a way that it is uh, spliced out intron 1 along with the exon 2 also. So now exon 1 and 3 is combining. So they are generating one transcript. Whereas there is possibility where exon 1 and 2 is combining but exon 3 is being spliced out. So in that case, then another transcript will be with the exon 1 and 2. So first was with the 1 and 3. Second one is with 1 and 2. And then there can also be the, means the spliceosome which is being used in removing these introns. So it is also possible that now exon 1 is also removed with the intron 1. So exon 2 and 3 are combining. So in that case, the new transcript will be with the exon 2 and 3. So in this case, the splicing is performed alternatively. Means it is generating different transcript products. One with the exon 1 and 3, one with the exon 1 and 2, and another with the exon 2 and 3. So here I have restricted to only three exons, but in your genes, the exons can be multiple. There were, they could be as long as uh, more than 100 also exons could be present. 
so it depends so in that case you can see that there could be different combinations that could be generated from the exons means different exons can combine so in drosophila the uh, not just in drosophila but in other organisms also higher eukaryotes this alternative splicing is being observed where the exons are joined in the uh, different combinations which generates different transcripts so those transcripts are product of means these are the product from the single gene and one is one information is also there that when you see one gene it uh, uh, makes multiple proteins so that is only possible with the help of this alternative splicing because if there is normal splicing then it will only form single protein but with the help of alternative splicing now it is uh, generating different combination of exons so it is um, generating multiple transcripts which is leading to the multiple uh, proteome uh, diversity from a single gene so alternative splicing is that and now how can alternative splicing directly converts an intron to an exon so firstly alternative splicing is not converting intron to exon intron is still intron but due to uh, issues with the spliceosomal complex or the spliceosomes which are involved in removing the introns so what happen in certain cases these spliceosomes there are certain sites present in the intron 5 prime and 3 prime region which are detected by these spliceosomes due to which they cut those introns from the uh, premature rna so in certain cases due to uh, problems in the spliceosomal complex or due to certain issues it is not able to recognize the Uh, splice sites in the introns due to which that intron remains uh, retained in the exons so in that case uh, that particular intron remain uh, means already remain retained in between two exons it is not removed now but it is not uh, converting to exon it is still intron only but now it depends in certain cases that particular uh, insertion of that intron can lead to frame shift events which can uh, change the sequence and now it depends that what kind of frame shift event has been performed that whether it is uh, going to change the amino acid sequence or whether it will lead to the degradation of the protein means premature degradation of the protein or whether it will uh, not form the protein so it depends but that intron is not named as exon it is still intron only but if we look at its property then in certain cases uh, it changes the sequence in such a way that it still codes for the protein but in certain cases Uh, it will lead to the uh, degradation of the proteins a premature uh, means uh, premature deletion of the protein yeah so you can say that means intron is not converting to exon but it is getting retained in between the exons and it has certain impacts means it is it will not always code so it is not always exon because exons are the ones which always code for protein okay so next question was can a pcr amplify a gene without we knowing its sequence okay so in pcr the primers which you use so they are the uh, so those are the oligo primers which have a certain sequence um, so that that is means for the pcr you need not to know the entire sequence and means you can design and there is a binding which happens between the primer and the gene sequence that is uh, means it need not to be completely identical the sequence of primer need not to be completely identical there are certain regions that are present in the end of the genes or there are certain uh, regions in the gene uh, which shows certain repeats so we can design the primers which has certain repeats or which has certain fragments that are mostly observed in all the genes so for that means we design such kind of primers so we need not to uh, know the sequence of the gene for the pcr we can design certain primers and they can bind to the genes means we do not uh, we do not uh, need to know the sequence for the amplification of the gene can the amino acid and carboxyl terminals of the proteins products be changed following alternative splicing okay so uh, yes alternative splicing can change the uh, carboxyl terminals of proteins uh, for example if we um, so uh, this alternative splicing can form multiple transcripts so out of those transcripts we consider one transcript as a principal isoform so uh, the transcript and isoforms these two words are used interchangeably so transcripts are the rna products whereas isoform is the protein product so uh, in certain cases what can happen is that if uh, different exons are being recombined 
so certain exons uh, so now these exons will be having some stop uh, signals or the stop codons it could be having so now if alternative splicing will form the multiple combination of exons so the exons which is having the stop codon if that is present now means if uh, mid intermediate or middle exons are being skipped and that exon is now lying next to the second or third exon so it will cause to the means it will having the stop codon so it will uh, stop the formation of that protein so in that case it can change the c terminal end of the protein product if we compare that protein to the uh, principal isoform means which we have uh, kept for the reference so principal isoform is the one which is having the majority of exons in it and then comes the other isoforms so we compare all the isoforms so in different isoforms the carboxyl terminals can change because now alternative splicing uh, is combining different exons so in that case the carboxy terminal sequence is also changing in another the n terminal sequence can also change because depending on the uh, different um, you can say different promoter regions or there are different uh, uh, start codons augs that are present so it depends that there could be different choice of the start codons that could be used and in that way different means the n terminal can end can also change whereas c terminal end can also change uh, with the help of this alternative splicing so yeah it can lead to the changes at the n terminal and c terminal okay can mixing exons from different genes possible to make different proteins okay so uh, those are known as chimeras means in which you uh, take different if you uh, take two different genes and you combine them so that is known as chimera but uh it generally depends that whether it will now code for certain functional protein or not because it will change the sequence so it entirely depends but if we talk about the splicing or if we talk about the natural proteins that are present in our body so in that case um, exons from two different genes they do not recombine but experimentally if we want to obtain then yeah we can obtain that we can uh, so those things those proteins are known as chimeric proteins in which um, so exons are nothing but those are the fragments of dna only so in chimeric proteins what we does is we take the different fragments from different genes uh, so in that case uh, different exons are taken from two different proteins and they are combined to generate some new protein that is known as chimeric protein so it is possible in experimentally but not in our biological tissues so are morpholinos considered as polymers or they are oligos containing dna or dna backbone okay so morpholinos are first of all they are 25 uh, subunits long they can be 18 to 25 subunits long uh, the term oligos is used because they are um, means they are you can say building block is the oligomeric because it is having morpholine ring then it is having base then uh, the two um, morpholine ring and the base they are attached to two means two units are being attached with the help of that phosphoramidate bond so in that case it is a oligomeric molecule which is having the oligomeric subunit so that subunit is oligomeric that's why it got its name oligo but it is a polymer because there are multiple oligos that are being connected so it is made up of uh, about 18 to 25 subunits so it is a polymer like dna but it is not long polymer it is a short polymer okay can if Uh, spread or attach freely in the cytoplasm or in nucleus okay so uh, i don't know why i'm uh, in sensing that you are kind of asking the questions which are given in your this assignment for the week 2 because in that i have read certain questions okay so um, uh, one thing i can give you one hint that these morpholinos uh, why they are used they are providing us with the better advantage as compared to the other agents because the morpholinos although they are analogs to dna but still they are non biological molecules due to which our cells are not able to recognize them as the foreign molecules for example if you think about the viral dna or viral rna if they enter our body and they attach to our uh, rna or dna so our body is able to recognize them and degrade them but this is the advantage with the morpholinos they act as non biological molecules due to which our body is not able to recognize them our body thinks that it is the normal molecule that is binding so in that case it can easily do it can easily travel that's why it is being used that's why it means that is the main principle that's why the morpholinos were selected so i think you you can now 
use this hint to know that means you can use this hint to answer the question that morphology knows they are the free bodies they are not attacked by our cells or anything and that's why they provide advantage so now you can think what could be the right answer okay so are there any doubts if there are no further doubts then i'll end the session i hope your doubts are cleared which you have the questions you've asked i hope they are cleared okay so ask if you have one doubt yeah yeah it's okay so the people who want to uh, means log off or who want to means go so they can go and if somebody has doubt then they can stay i have no issue i can answer to your doubts it's completely fine so how cdna used for the polymerase chain reaction process okay so um, i think that for this so there is also another question that is present in your assignment which is somewhat related to this only okay so when you use cdna then um, firstly you can go with the dna or the mrna so when you uh, deal with the rna and you want to amplify that gene so what you do you convert that rna to cdna by the help of reverse uh, with the help of reverse transcriptase and then you convert it to it into cdna now you are having cdna and now you can proceed with the simple method which is generally used so um if we have the dna so similarly if we have double stranded dna so now we'll provide it with the dna polymerases stack polymerases and then nucleotides so in cdna now you do not need the means you uh, in rt pcr you need reverse transcriptase so in cdna you do not need now you do not need reverse transcriptases you can simply go with the uh, polymerases and the other ingredients that are being used in the pcr because cdna are nothing but these are like the dna molecules only so you generate the duplex and then you use the uh, similar machinery in the pcr as you use with the dna you provide the polymerases and you provide with the another nucleotides you provide with the primers and then you'll proceed with the pcr so it is same as the dna because you are already obtained the cdna although it is used in rt pcr but you have you are you have reached the stage of cdna so now you do not need reverse transcriptase and rest steps will be similar as rt pcr only okay so if there are no further doubts then i'll end the session yeah 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 it's right so if you have cdna then you do not need reverse transcription because reverse transcription is generally done to convert the mrna to cdna so now if you have cdna so you do not need reverse transcription step right okay so so should i end the session or do you have any other doubt okay thank you so much so i'll end the session we'll see you in the next session and we'll also discuss few problems that will be means given in the assignment 2 in the week 2 so if there will be certain problems which will be difficult then we'll discuss in the next session and next session i'll try to uh, incorporate new mcqs so that repetitions doesn't happen okay so i'm ending the session thank you so much